Welcome to Jerseys for Social Justice, ETSU Athletics video campaign highlighting our black student athletes and coaches and their stories of being black in America. This is not just an athletics effort, it is campus-wide here at ETSU. Our first 10 videos focused on our student athletes, coaches, and administrators within athletics. Today we welcome in from the university side, Dr. Keith Johnson, the VP of Equity and Inclusion at the university, and Karshanda Martin, the director of the Multicultural Center at ETSU. Dr. Johnson, Karshanda, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I'd like to start with you, Karshanda. Student athletes have shared many stories during this video campaign. A lot of them have varied from their first experience with racism to when they knew racism was a reality to the last few months. We've seen, of course, just horrible atrocities um, in the streets of America uh, as police brutality has persisted and what they feel needs to change. I think very important things as their future unfolds. I'd like to hear your thoughts on those subjects as well. Uh, your experiences with racism and what you've seen in your lifetime. Is racism worse now than ever or is it just more visible the last 10 to 15 years with the rise of social media and technology? You know, I, 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 I reflect on that question and I just go through my life and um, there's moments in my life where I remember racism as a child. I remember the looks and the um, remarks that were displayed to me and my family walking into a grocery store or at a football game or what have you. And so, you know, as a small child to recent day, even as this week, those same things are happening. And so I think in terms of racism, um, racism has been around for a long time and racism is still evident today. I think with the rise of cell phones with um, social media, I think now people know that racism still exists. And I think for many years, especially with um, our first black president, it was like, oh, racism is no longer. Um, however, um, we know in the community that we still have a systematic um, issue that goes on not only on this campus and this community, but nationwide. And so I think when you see the videos from the 60s, they are still very similar videos that we're seeing in 2020. Um, and so um, I think my life as being an African-American female, um, I experience that each and every day. I look through the lens of of wondering what people think of me as being an African-American female, as a director, um, you know, as, as a daughter, as a friend, as a cousin. Um, I wish that I can just be okay with that and just be comfortable in my skin. But unfortunately, the world that we live in and the society that we live in, I'm worried to even sleep in my own bed. I'm worried to even walk into a grocery store to get something, to go for a run in my own neighborhood or a walk. Because of the color of my skin, um, I'm worried to do those things. And um, unfortunately, people in the 60s had that same experience. And um, not only our student athletes, but our community is still facing that today. Sad but unfortunate reality. Dr. Johnson, you say that equity and inclusion are cornerstones for you and always have been. Has the road to true equity and inclusion in our society gotten any easier over time or is it just as difficult to navigate that as ever? I think it's just, <clears throat> it's just as difficult to, to navigate. I think things are a little bit different. You know, I've been around um, probably a little bit longer than Krishanda has, you know. I was born in, in the height of a, a lot of civil rights movements back in the early 1960s. And so I grew up in a household where that was prominent in terms of the discussion, right? You would see things on TV as a, as a young boy, but I had very little, if any, understanding of what was going on. And so my parents, I think, did a great job um, uh, protecting my brother and I from a lot of the, the, the things that were happening around us. The unfortunate thing, um, you know, growing up in the South in the 1960s, uh, what we saw was a lot of the overt uh, racism that was prevalent. Uh, you knew uh, what was really going on. Um, and uh, as, as I, I became older um, and definitely in my teens, you know, I began to see things change a little bit. So now we're into the late 1970s. And I see where we're starting to transition from this overt style of racism to, to covert yeah. uh, racism. And so we, you begin to see it happening more so um, from a policy perspective, right? 
you start looking at uh, the um, data as it applies to employment, data as it applies to housing, data as it applies to uh, scholarships, um, health care, um, family wealth, those kinds of things. You see the disparities, you know, really, uh, really widening, you know. So that was happening in, in policy. So, so now, you know, to kind of speed things up into to recent years with the onset of social media, we are beginning to see kind of both being blended, kind of co-mingled together, overt and co covert. And so as uh, Karshanda indicated, um, at one point prior to, to cell phones and the availability of uh, social media, we were beginning to see one side. I don't think behavior has changed per se, you know, in terms of the racism. It's just that now you're seeing a perspective from the person who's, um, who's on the receiving end of the racism, right? So we're seeing this on a more regular basis, which gives us a, a notion that it must be worse. I, I don't think it's worse. I think it's just being uh, more visible in, in terms of what we see. And, and again, I know this, this, this project is, is being motivated by a lot of the athletes. And, and of course, what's interesting is that I, like the athletes, experience something very similar as well. Athletes have uniforms, I have a suit. And when I take off my suit, you know, I, I transition from, uh, Superman to Clark Kent. When I'm on campus in the classroom and meetings with a with suit on, I'm Dr. Johnson. But when I go to a store with my sweatpants on, I'm um, potentially this thug who someone in that store is following me around with an expectation that I'm gonna take something. So yes, it's been very difficult to uh, navigate, uh, but nevertheless, uh, my goal is to navigate uh, until we can actually change. So I think we're making some leeway, but there's a lot more uh, uh, space for us to make some improvements and that's been a part of my goal since coming to ETSU. This is for both of you, Karshanda, I'll start with you. In your work on a micro level for these student athletes and for the campus community, what issues do you see popping up again and again and do those issues reflect what we see on a regional and countrywide basis? Hmm. You know, I'm going to speak directly for our athletes um, and their experiences. You know, what resonates with me right now is our athletes are going through the same challenges as any person of color is right now. They are having to watch people that look like them get mugged down, get shot, get kneed down and killed. And they're having to process it differently and show up for practice. They're having to show up for a game with a smile on their face for the fans, for the ETSU community. And, you know, I, th I don't know if we are creating a space for them to be able to um, um, to process that and to say, you know, I look just like that person that was just killed, you know, and are these fans or these ETSU community members, do they feel the same way about me? And so it seems like our athletes of color have to sort of wear different hats. And so when they're on the field, they're an ETSU athlete, but when they walk off the field, they are an African-American male, African-American female. And are we supporting them in the same way? Are we supporting them because they're scoring for us? Or are we supporting for them because they're standing up for what is right? And so I hope that when these student athletes speak up for social justice, that the community and fans are still behind them um, because not only are they wear the hat of an athlete, but they wear a hat as an African-American female, as an African-American male um, and they are having to process what our country is going through in a different way. Dr. Johnson? When I think about the, the athlete, and an athlete and especially if an athlete is good, that athlete has capacity um, to impact a lot of people. Um, I don't think there's too many opportunities where there is a bad time to do right, right? And, and if it is, it's very rare. But there's always the, the, a good time to do right. And so with, with, with athletes, this is a great time for them to be able to exercise their right to speak against a lot of the, the, the ills of this country, whether it's racism, whether it's exclusion, whether it's a lack of diversity. And when I think about supporting our athletes, um, is there a lot that we can do as a university? Is there a lot that we can do as a country? Of course we can. And, 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 and let me just be specific to East Tennessee State University with the, with the 
application that it could be used other where, in other places. When I think about East Tennessee State University, you know, at least this region, or at least part of the country, we know that, and I'll use a, um, a medical example first, and then I go back to athletics. Uh, we know that based on all kinds of studies, and it's been historical, that patients uh, uh, of color who have uh, physicians and nurses of color have a tendency to do better, fare better health-wise. That's documented. Uh, that's not my opinion, it's just documented. We also know that students of color who have faculty of color and others of color in their lives when they come through these educational institutions, and specifically, specifically ETSU, have a tendency to do much better as well. So when I look at East Tennessee State University and many universities that are not HBCUs, uh, what you find is that an overwhelming majority of those students or athletes, student athletes, are people of color. So if we know that it works well in the classroom and it works well in a, in a medical setting, it works well in pretty much all areas. And so when I look at our demographics in terms of uh, leadership in athletics as well as our university, it's definitely disproportional. Right? So if we know based on the data that our students do better and we have a large number of our students of color in athletics and you look at the administration of athletics, you find that uh, leadership is lacking in terms of people of color. Not picking on ETSU, it's just what it is. And that's reflective across the country. And so when I think about athletes and their ability to reach people, they have a tremendous ability to reach people. And I think we have to support our students because those students are generating a lot of funds for these institutions. Uh, they are generating a lot of recognitions for these institutions. In many cases, they're putting these institutions on the map because in, for some of the institutions, if it wasn't for the sport, you know, a lot of the students that we recruit wouldn't come to that institution. And if it wasn't for sports in those institutions, a lot of people would have no idea where some of these institutions are. I think in speaking on East Tennessee State University, just talking for the athletic department here, I think the goal that we all have is to create that space. I don't think you'll find many in the athletic department that would say we've done enough and that we are at the point we want to be at, which you know, hopefully the series that we're talking with you about here, Jerseys for Social Justice, is a good first step and there's a lot of steps behind that where we do make progress. In order to achieve equity and inclusion for all, it's going to take an effort from all. That's young and old, black and white, people in leadership positions like yourself, peons like me. Uh, where do you think we need to start? Where are we lacking right now? Where does the change need to occur at this moment? Change has to start with yourself. And I think you have to look um, in a mirror and see your, pre your privileges, your, your biases as an individual. Um, and then we can have a conversation as a whole to see what changes need. I think that doesn't happen a lot because I think when people say, oh, I don't have privilege or I'm not a racist, I'm not a bias, you know, everyone has something within their self that they're biased about. Everyone has privileges, even the marginalized individuals have some sort of privilege. And so you really have to reflect on that before you can have a conversation about what change needs to happen. Um, but then action. I think we talk a lot. I think we talk a lot about, let's do this, let's do this video, let's do this training, let's, let's do all these check boxes. And then it's like, okay, great, we did it. Um, but then there's no action behind it. And so, you know, like with these series, I'm very excited about this. And I'm excited about the conversation because it's just not a video. There's some action steps behind it. And I think for for the whole community, ETSU community, Johnson City, Tri-Cities community, we, we need to have action plans behind it. And so I think the momentum is great. I know me and Dr. Johnson talk about this a lot, that the momentum is here and so we can't stop and so we have to continue. And we just can't say that we've done one thing and say, great, we've checked the box. We sent out this email, great, we've done this video. Um, what are action plans that are going to really make a systematic change for the campus of East Tennessee State University? University. And we're discussing action plans and next steps with Dr. Brian Nolan, president of the university, and Calvin Claggett in our next video that will be released tomorrow. Dr. Johnson? I think for starters, we have to come to a fundamental understanding, and that is um, the understanding that this is not a minority problem. Mm -hmm. This is not a black problem, right? This is an American problem. And so another fundamental understanding that we have to have is that people who look like me 
are not the only ones who can solve this problem. In fact, if, if it was just people who look like me, we would never solve the problem. We need people who represent all populations of people in this country to be able to help solve this problem. So if we can come to that fundamental understanding, develop a, a, a level of advocacy that we've never had before. Because if you're in a position where you have policies and uh, practices that hurt or harm uh, people uh, based on their race, color, ethnicity, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that's racism. And so we have to root that racism out. Oftentimes we are in positions where we think it's someone else's responsibility to, to fix this. We all have capacity. We all, all ha are have a space where we, we function every day when we come to work. And if there's anything that we can do in our little area that can change practices or policies that hurt or harm people based on their color, their race, or their ethnicity, we need to change it. And if we choose not to, that's not only a disservice to those individuals who it impact the most in a negative way, but it's also a disservice to us. I can't imagine working in an environment where there are people who, who don't look like me, right? Uh, when you look at how talented we are, whether it's on the uh, football field or the basketball court, just imagine people who look like me were no longer a part of that, right? I, can't, I just can't imagine working in an environment where, where there are no people of color who's at any level. Because when you think about people of color, they bring in or we bring in a different perspective, right? And that perspective is what we need to help us to be better solver, problem solvers. And that's what we need right now. And so we have to understand those fundamental things on the front end or else we're gonna talk around this and never get to a place where we can root out some of the problems and create an environment that's conducive for everyone to learn, live, love, and do, er do everything else that we normally would do in an environment that's, that where we feel supportive. You mentioned your perspectives, Dr. Johnson, Karshanda, both very important in this series. I wanna leave the viewers with this final question. Karshanda, I'll start with you. What is the most important message, the one you need to convey to not only the student athletes here at ETSU that you've heard from, the coaches you've heard from, administrators, but those that may be watching around the country on the NCAA's equity and inclusion social media campaign? I think for, for us as the Multicultural Center, you know, we're here for our student athletes. And so, yes, we're on a different side of campus, and, um, and we, but we have programming and we have support. And, you know, I, I, I want a lot more um, partnerships and, um, and, and collaborations to grow out of this. And because it takes a village, it takes everyone, and I don't want us to be siloed. And, uh, you know, I'm very glad that we, we've had that partnership with, with us and with athletics and with other um, individuals on campus, but we have to continue. And again, it has to grow outside ETSU. It just can't be in our small community. It can be the whole conference. It can be the whole state. It can be the whole region. Um, but we all just have to support each other. And even if we look different or we're on different aisles of you know, the political rim right now, we still can come together um, on, on a common ground and just show love and compassion and support for one another and stop fighting, you know, like let's, let, let's just fight, start fighting against each other because if we can come together, we can do so much more for our students, our student athletes, for our community and, and just for the world in general. Dr. Johnson, your message is the highest ranking equity and inclusion officer at this university. Well, message is pretty simple. Uh, don't underestimate uh, your reach and impact. I think we all have reach, we have all have impact, and we all have power. Uh, we have the power to influence. Um, I don't want any student, faculty, staff, or anyone to underestimate that because you're not sure who you're impacting. I think student athletes have a great opportunity to be able to, to tell their stories, to impact their fans, because not everyone are like athletes and that athletes can bring anybody together, regardless of your religious beliefs, regardless of your political views. You can pack a stadium, you can pack wherever you're, you're performing, and you have that audience. And I would tell anyone to use your power for the good. Dr. Johnson, Karshanda, thank you both so much. Your perspectives have been hugely important for this series, for those watching, for this university, and your work, I know, reaches just that far as well. Thank you so much for your time today. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much.